Okay, this is our ninth lecture in the summer general chemistry class, and it's all about the ideal gas law. And we're going to talk about um, three individual laws that that went into making the gas law, and those are Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Avogadro's law. And we'll we'll talk specifically on what those those laws stated and how they. Uh, fit into the ideal gas law. And I'm going to probably go kind of quickly through these slides and I'll, I'll probably skip some of them, and especially at the end, and I'll let you know what, what will and will not be important for our class. Really in chapter 5, I think it's all about algebra. If you can do algebra on these equations, um, it's just basic plug and chug. Um, you might have to convert to, to units, and it, as always, it's important to, to, to keep your units straight and do dimensional analysis. That becomes really, really important um, uh, in Chapter 5. So we'll be covering the first um, three sections in this chapter. Those are the most important. Um, we will talk a little bit about Chapter 5.4, how you can rearrange the ideal gas law um, to put molecular weight in and density in. Um, not a whole lot of material will be on that, but that is sort of important. And then maybe briefly talk about the kinetic theory, but you won't need to know it for the exam. All right. And then 5.6 is also not, not covered. All right. So three states of matter, I think everyone's familiar with this, right? Um, solid, everything's, all the molecules are really tight together, don't move. Liquid, they're still in contact with one another, um, still, you know, fairly dense, but they're mobile. Uh, gas, gases are much different than the other two phases because they're, they occupy a, a much larger volume and the molecules are moving really, really fast and they're really far, far apart relatively. Right. And um, when we discussed briefly the kinetic theory of, of gases, I mean really the, the reason why gases have pressure is because their molecules are moving really fast and they're contacting the side of whatever vessel they're in and that's exerting a force on that vessel. That's what leads to the pressure. Right, and that, that's just something you don't really have with solids and liquids. Right. So what are some other differences? Right? It's kind of obvious if you just look at solids, liquids, and gases, they're different. Um, but what, what sort of things are different that you might not notice? Well, or, or think about really. Gas volume, it changes significantly with pressure. Uh, both solids and liquids, their volumes don't really change very much by pressure. Right? You push really, really hard on something solid, like a rock, its volume doesn't change. You push really, really hard on, let's say, a balloon that's filled with gas, and its volume is going to change. Right? It, its volume is going to be affected by that pressure you're exerting on it. Second, gas volume changes significantly with temperature, and this might be a little bit less obvious, right? But gases expand when they're heated and they're cooled, they, when they shrink, excuse me, when they're cooled, they shrink, right? The volume change is about 50 to 100 times greater for gases than it is liquids and solid, solids when we're talking about the volume change with temperature. Uh, gases flow very freely, right? You think of liquids as flowing freely. Gases flow even more freely than, than a liquid would. Um, they have very low densities, especially compared to the other two phases. And they can actually form solutions with other gases and in really any proportions, right? So gases can freely mix with other gases. And some physical properties of gases, one of those is pressure. Right? It, 
when we talk about gases, a lot of times we talk about pressure. And what pressure is, is it's a force divided by an area. And don't worry about that equation. You're never going to have to calculate a force, okay? But just keep in mind that the, the measurement of pressure is a force divided by an area. And there's something called atmospheric pressure. And that is arising from the force that's pressing down by the atmosphere on the surface of the Earth, right? So that pressure um, we feel ourselves, I mean, maybe we don't consciously feel it, but we have this whole atmosphere of gas pressing down on, on each of us, uh, and that's due to atmospheric pressure. Right? And this atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude because as you go up in altitude, you have less and less of the atmosphere above you pressing down on you. Right? And this, I thought this figure in the book was kind of interesting, and it's a good figure to illustrate this uh, with, with atmospheric pressure. Right? When you have a, a paint, like a, any kind of a vessel, but in this case it's a paint thinner container and they're sucking the the air out of it with a vacuum pump and if you you do that the pumps off the containers normal you turn the pump on and it, it sucks everything out and it crushes the container it's easy to think about that and think oh the the pump is sucking all the air out and that's caught in that in itself is causing the the container to, to scrunch in but what's really happening is the the pump is pulling all the the air out of that container and then what causes it the the crushing of the container is the atmospheric pressure pushing in on the container is actually pressing in on it and crushing it right it's not it's not the pump it's not the vacuum itself it's the atmospheric pressure right? and that's a good demonstration that there is atmospheric pressure pressing in on and around everything on the surface of the Earth, including us. Right. One way to measure atmospheric pressure is with a uh, mercury barometer. And a very simple one is shown here. Right. And this, I don't know if it's that important for our class, but uh, it's just kind of to, good to know how atmospheric pressure is measured. Right. Um, you have a, a dish filled with mercury, and then in that dish you have a tube uh, that has a vacuum in it, and mercury can, can fill that tube. Well, how high mercury goes in the tube is related to the, the atmospheric pressure. So you have a pressure of the atmosphere pressing down um, on this mercury that's in this open dish. Right? And that's what that does is it, it causes it to be pushed up this tube to a certain extent. And the, the pressure of the atmosphere pressing down on the mercury is equal to uh, the pressure due to the weight of the mercury in the tube. And at sea level, uh, typically the atmospheric pressure, it, it does change. Uh, it does change uh, with, with kind of weather patterns, but typically atmospheric pressure at sea level would be 760 millimeters of mercury, right? And that millimeters of mercury is, is a, a measure, a height of how much that mercury rises in that tube, right? So that's where that millimeters of mercury unit comes from for pressure, right? We also call millimeters of mercury a tor. There's a, a couple other ways, um, these closed-end manometer and open-end manometer. Um, just go through that briefly, right? If you have a closed-end with a vacuum in it, right, and this elbow down here, the mercury levels are equal when, when there's a vacuum on both sides. But when you put gas into to the left side here, that gas, its pressure is going to push against the mercury, and the mercury will move. And then that difference in height can, can give you the pressure of the gas. Sort of similar to the, to the barometer that we saw before. And then 
there's an open end manometer that's open to the atmosphere so you have atmospheric pressure pressing down so if if the pressure of the atmosphere is greater than the pressure of the gas you'll get a, a height this way if the pressure of the gas is greater than an atmosphere pressure you'll get uh, measure a delta H this way right not not important for this class though right. common units of pressure we're going to be dealing primarily in this unit atmospheres right and that's equal to one atmosphere of pressure and remember from the the mercury barometer that equals 760 millimeters of mercury so 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere and the other unit you see a lot is in tor and basically a tor is a millimeter of mercury okay so don't know why there are two units for that that are essentially the same exact scale but but there are okay uh, other times you might see bars or pascals or kilopascals um, I probably won't put those on the exam um, most likely not but you might see those in a homework uh, problem and if you do just refer back to this table table 5.1 and you can convert between different units of pressure right and in the gas law what pressure you use is determined by the units of the gas constant that you're using okay so you can we're going to typically be using atmospheres but you can use other units of pressure other um, measures of pressure uh, if you use a different gas constant value all right speaking of the gas laws all right let's talk about the three individual gas laws that lead into the, the ideal gas law right. so the gas laws themselves are describing physical behaviors of gases and there's four variables pressure which we've talked a little bit about uh, temperature I think we're all experienced with what temperature is volume right that's the 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 area in which the gas occupies right area is kind of a bad word but um, it's the space in which the the gas occupies and finally the amount which we typically use number of moles and that is uh, a little lower case n okay an ideal gas is a gas that exhibits linear relationships in these variables right and for, for the purposes of our class, you can con consider every gas we talk about as being an ideal gas. In reality, um, gases are very close to, to ideal behavior, but they do have some deviations. But we're not going to get into the deviations in this class. All right, so the first law came from a guy named Boyle so we call it Boyle's law and it describes the relationship between the volume and the pressure of a gas All right so we use uh, or I should say he used uh, open end manometer right and when that's open to the atmosphere he had a certain amount of mercury in it and then a gas sample that was trapped on the other side so this is open to the atmosphere so you know one atmosphere is pressing down on this side right so the pressure uh, is going to be uh, of the gas on this side is going to be equal to one atmosphere plus whatever that delta H value is and, and in this example it's 20 millimeters of mercury okay or 20 tor so the total pressure on this side is 760 tor plus 20 tor is 780 tor and at that pressure the volume of that gas is 20 milliliters okay. then what he did was he added more mercury in this case the the delta H was now 800 excuse, yeah 800 millimeters right so you have still have atmospheric pressure pressing down but now you have 800 millimeters of mercury so you add those together and you get 1560 torr All right so double you're doubling the pressure and when they doubled the pressure the volume 
halved. It got cut in half. It went from 20 milliliters to 10 milliliters, right? So Boyle's Law, when after doing this uh, a bunch of times, right, and, and keeping track of the data, right, here's the pressure and here's the volumes, what he noticed was that as the, the pressure went up, the volume went down. But multiplying volume times pressure gave a constant value. Right, so you could plot it out, just volume versus pressure, and you got this sort of a, a relationship. But when you, when you plot it, volume um, on the y-axis versus 1 over pressure, it was a linear relationship. Right, so then Boyle's law, after compiling all this data, um, what Boyle's law stated was at constant temperature, that's a big that's a big caveat, at constant temperature, the volume occupied by a fixed amount of gas is inversely proportional to the external pressure. Right, so you can write it this way. Volume is proportional to uh, one over pressure or inversely proportional to pressure. The other way you can write it, and probably the more important way for us, is that pressure times volume is a constant. Right? So if you multiply both sides by pressure, you get Vp is proportional to a constant, right? or equals a constant. Right? So this, when we actually work with um, the gas law at constant temperature and amount, it, it sort of changes into this form. Pressure times volume equals constant. And again, this is at fixed temperature and fixed amount of gas or n moles of gas. Right? Pressure is going to decrease when the volume increases, and pressure increases when the volume decreases. Okay. Another set of experiments was done by a, a guy named Charles. So this is called Charles's Law, and it's the relationship between the volume and the temperature of a gas. So what he did is he had an open-ended tube with a, a plug, a mercury plug, and there's trapped air inside. Right? So you knew the, the pressure's constant, it's at um, atmospheric pressure. And then you would watch the mercury plug move, and, and that said something about the volume of gas trapped inside. So when he put this in, let's say, a, a beaker with ice in it, so that's at about zero degrees Celsius, right? There, there was a, a certain volume of gas. Then he would heat that water that that, that open-ended tube was in, and he'd watch the, the mercury plug move up and the volume change, right? So when he plotted volume versus temperature, what he found was volume divided by the temperature was a constant. Okay, so volume versus temperature gave a linear linear lines. Right, and so what after doing this these experiments over and over again, he came up with the law, and the law was states at constant pressure. The volume occupied by a fixed amount of gas is directly proportional to its temperature, and that temperature is uh, absolute temperature in Kelvin. Right, so you can write it, volume is proportional to temperature, or um, divide each side by temperature, and what you get is volume divided by temperature is equal to a constant. And so this is Charles's laws at fixed pressure and N. Volume is going to decrease as temperature decreases, and volume increases as temperature increases. So they're directly proportional. Right. The final gas law is called Avogadro's law, and this is the relationship between the volume and the amount of gas. Right. So in this example, you have uh, 0.1 moles of CO2, uh, dry ice, and you put that in a container. Once that solid CO2 turns into a gas, it, it occupies a certain volume, right? and that pressure is just atmospheric pressure pu pushing down on it. Now if we have start with twice as much 
dry ice, 0.2 moles of CO2, when that expands and, and turns all into gas form, what we have is um, the volume is going to be twice as much as the volume of the 0.1 mole sample. Okay, So what Avogadro's law states is that at a fixed temperature and pressure, equal volumes of any ideal gas contain equal numbers of particles, or you can think of that as equal number of moles of the gas. Okay. Uh, we're going to skip that. Um, gas behavior at standard conditions. So STP, you might see that. So it's referred to as standard temperature and pressure. And that what standard conditions are, uh, as we define them, at one atmosphere, that's, remember, 760 torr, and the temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. Right? So that might be a little bit... Um, something you might have to remember. Right? It's not room temperature, it's zero degrees Celsius, which is 273 degrees Kelvin. Right? So at these, these standard temperature and pressure conditions, there's what we refer to as a standard molar volume. And that's the volume of one mole of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure. And that standard volume is 22.4 liters. Okay. So it doesn't matter what gas you're looking at, if it's at standard temperature and pressure and you have one mole of it, you're going to get 22.4 liter volume of that gas. Okay. And so th that, that figure is just kind of showing, um, showing you the same volumes, right? Helium, N2, and O2 obviously have much different uh, molar masses. And so when you calculate the densities, that's on the very bottom, um, the densities are going to be different, obviously. But the volumes are the same. That's really the important take-home uh, from standard temperature and pressure of an ideal gas. And so if we look at uh, the volume of one mole of an ideal gas, that's 22.4 liters. Uh, so one gallon of milk is about 3.79 liters. That's shown here. Right? This balloon represents 22.4 liters. Right? Uh, basketball is about 7.5 liters. And a 2 liter of soda. Right? That's sort of showing you the, the relative sizes. I will say that thinking about volumes is probably one of the hardest um, physical units to kind of comprehend. Um, you can think about lengths and distances and times and that all seems easy to kind of convert between in, in your mind, but thinking about volumes, it, it it's a little bit trickier. So these three gas laws, um, Boyle's, Charles's, and uh, Avogadro's gas law, were all combined into what's known as the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law, you might have used this in high school. Um, sorry, this should be a capital P, but PV equals NRT. Right? And that's pressure times volume equals Number of moles times gas constant R times temperature. And so R, if um, you want to use standard conditions, um, right? Pressure would be one atmosphere. Um, volume is 22.4 liters. N is one mole at standard conditions, standard temperature pressure conditions, and temperature is 273, right? So if you're not given an R value, you can always calculate one using standard temperature pressure conditions. And when we do that, we plug everything in, we get that R is 0 0.0821 atmospheres times liters divided by moles Kelvin. So that's the unit of the gas constant. Uh, if it is a value of 0 0.0821. Right. 
the numerical value of r is going to depend on the units that you use. The ideal gas law can also be expressed in this way, right? And what we're doing here is we're basically using this equation and solving it for R, the gas constant, right? Because it is a constant. So we can do that at one, uh, one set of conditions, and we can do that at another set of conditions as well. And since both are going to be equal to R, you can set them equal to each other. And so this is a, a common way that you solve ideal gas problems is you actually write PV equals NRT for one set of conditions and PV equals NRT for another set of conditions and then rearrange the equations and to set them equal to a constant and then set them equal to each other. Okay, and if you're curious, where did these come from? Well, the pressure volume, uh, if, you, if you hold uh, N and T constant, if you hold N and T constant, uh, pressure times volume is just going to be a constant. Um, and so you can kind of backtrack out Boyle's law. Uh, Charles's law, remember that's at fixed N and fixed P. That's just going to be um, volume equals a constant, which would be R in our case, times temperature. And finally, Avogadro's law, volume equals a constant times N. So we rearrange the ideal gas law to solve for volume, right? If it's at fixed pressure and temperature, Volume is going to be um, equal to a constant times n. Okay, so let's try some problems. Okay, first problem, you have 5.6 grams of solid CO2. Put that in an empty sealed 4 liter container at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. When all the CO2 becomes gas, what will the pressure be in the container? Okay, so we're, we're considering that the container was completely empty to start with. So the pressure is only going to be due to the CO2 that we put in. Right? So what we're going to have to, uh, this is a ideal gas problem, so we're going to be using PV equals NRT. Right? So the volume we're given, 4 liters. Temperature we're given, 300 Kelvin. R is just a constant. It's 0 0.08205. And the units are liters times atmosphere divided by mole Kelvin. Uh, N, we are sort of given. So N, we're given... 5.6 grams of CO2. We need to end to be into moles, right? So let's convert that to moles. So we divide by the molecular weight of CO2, which is 44 grams per mole. That gives us 0 0.1272 moles. So now we have everything except the pressure. All right, so we want to rearrange our equation. And I recommend rearranging this equation uh, before you plug anything into it. So PV equals NRT. If we're trying to solve for pressure, what we're going to do is divide by volume on each side. So pressure equals NRT divided by volume. We can plug all the values in. Um, 4 liters uh, for volume, 300K for temperature. Let's just do that. 0 0.1272 moles times 0.8205 liters atmosphere mole K. Sorry, I ran out of room here. 
Uh, temperature would be 300 K and then divide it by the volume which was 4 liters. Right, when we do that the pressure we get is 0.783 atmospheres. Okay. Okay, second problem and this is uh, the relationship with Boyle's law. So if we have a J tube and the gas trapped inside that occupies 13 cubic centimeters at 1.05 atmospheres, you add mercury to the tube, it increases the pressure on the trapped air to 4.39 atmospheres. Assuming a constant temperature, what is the new volume of air? All right. So this is a situation where we're going to have basically write two equations. So P1, whoops, here we go, eraser. Okay, so the, the plan is um, shown here, uh, but really what you want to do in a situation like this where you have beginning conditions and ending conditions is you want to write the ideal gas law for each set of conditions. So you have P1 V1 equals NRT, and you also have P2 V2 equals NRT. Right? And we're not putting one or two by the, the N's or the T's because those are staying fixed. Right? So they're, they're the same uh, in the before case and the after case or the set number one conditions and set number two conditions. Those don't change. Okay. So if those don't change, what we can do is set these equations equal to each other. So that be, becomes P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Uh, sorry about that, that line there. I don't know what, what, what's going on with my pen. But hopefully you can see P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Right. And then we can simply start plugging some of these numbers in. Right, we have pressure initially was 1.05 atmospheres. Uh, pressure 2 becomes 4.39 atmospheres. The volume was initially um, 13 cubic centimeters. Right, and the, the unit conversion is shown here in the center. We convert that to liters which would be 0 0.013 liters, right? And then, so that's V1. V2 is what we're trying to find, right? So we solve the equation P1 V1 equals P2 V2 for V2. P1 V1 over uh, P2. Then we plug everything in, and when you do that, you should get V2 equals 0 0.0031, and the, the units would be liters. So that equals 3.1 milliliters of volume. Right? And does that make sense? Well, we started, we had 13 set, uh, milliliter volume when we had one atmosphere of pressure. Then we raised the pressure by about four times to four atmospheres. So the volume is going to shrink, right? If you have something, uh, a gas, and you increase the pressure on it, it's going to, its volume is going to decrease. Okay. Let's try another practice question. Now this time we're we're looking at the volume temperature relationship, and remember that's from Charles's law. So we have a balloon that's filled with two liters of air at 25 degrees Celsius. Then it's placed in a car in the sun. What is the volume of the balloon when the temperature in the car reaches 100 degrees Celsius? 
Okay, so that that um, isn't stated, but it, the balloon is exposed to the air, so atmospheric pressure, so the pressure is staying constant, and the amount of material in the balloon isn't changing, so N is staying constant. So this is really a relationship between volume and temperature. All right, and again, it's important, I think, to write the ideal gas law out for each set, so P1, V1 equals, uh, and I made a mistake already. Okay, so pressure is staying constant, so we don't have to write. Okay, so P times V1 equals N R T1. And we can also write PV2 equals NRT2. Right, then we can rearrange both of these so that volume and temperature are on one side and all the, the things that are staying constant are on the other. So that would become V1 divided by T1 equals NR divided by P. And we have V2 divided by T2 equals NRP. So since those are equal to the same thing, we can set them equal to each other. V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. And what, what are all these? Um, what, do, what are we given? So we're given volume 1 equals 2 liters. Temperature 1 equals 25 degrees Celsius. To convert that into Kelvin, we need to add 273. Um, and, sorry, that would give us 298 Kelvin. Uh, volume 2 is what we're looking for. And temperature 2 is 100 degrees Celsius, which would be uh, 373 Kelvin. So then we look back at our expression, and we can solve, solve it for V2. So V2 is going to equal, damn, V1 divided by T1 times T2. Okay, when we plug everything in, you should get a volume equal to 2.5, dang it, 2.5 liters. Okay, sorry about that. Computer has a mind of its own. Okay. Another practice question. A helium-filled balloon has a volume of 15 liters at a pressure of 620 millimeters of mercury, which would be 0.82 atmospheres. And the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius uh, on a summer's day in Denver. What is the volume of the balloon on top of Mount Elbert, Colorado's highest mountain, where the atmospheric pressure is 445 millimeters of mercury, or 0.58 atmospheres, and the temperature is seven degrees Celsius. All right, so how do we answer this type of question? Well, what isn't given is the number of moles. So we're gonna have to use the conditions that they're given us in, on a summer's day in Denver, because we're given a volume, a pressure, and a temperature, T1. So we should be able to calculate a amount, a number of moles. Okay. And to do that, you use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And you can think of this as P1V1 equals 
uh, n r t1. Rearrange everything to solve for n. p1 v1 divided by r times t1. When we do that, you should get out, and remember to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, you should get 0.487 moles. Okay. And then in the second part of the question, at Mount Elbert, what's the volume? Then you use the ideal gas law again, P2 V2 equals N, N doesn't change because it's inside a sealed balloon, RT2, and we solve for V2, N R T2 divided by P2. So when you plug everything in, you should get 19.3 liters. Okay. Fairly easy algebra, but it it seems it, it's maybe not easy for everyone. So if you if you struggle with this algebra, um, it's just multiplying and dividing, but um, really be careful and use your units. Watch your units. They will they should cancel out and give you the unit you're expecting. Okay. Uh, final question for for a little bit in this lecture. Uh, piston and cylinder it is depicted before and after gaseous reaction. So the number of moles of gas is, is changing because there's a chemical reaction occurring. The temperature is 150 Kelvin before the reaction and 300 Kelvin after the reaction. Now you're assuming that the cylinder is insulated, so no, t no heat is being lost. Which of the following balanced equation describes the reaction? So how how the heck would you answer this? Well, this is a case where pressure and volume is not changing because you can the piston is exposed to air, uh, atmospheric pressure, and the it, it's not going up or down. So the pressure is the same on both sides, and the volume is the same on both sides. So what's changing is the number of moles and the temperature. So we can write our PV equals N1RT1 and on this side we'd have PV equals N2RT2. Okay. Then we again uh, keep try to get the N, N1 and T1 together so N1 times T1 equals PV divided by R and 2t2 equals PV divided by R. Right, now we can set these equal to each other. I'll just do it on this side. N1t1 equals N2t2. And then also what we can notice is that T2 is 300 Kelvin and T1 is 150 Kelvin. So if we just plug those values in, so N1 times 150 Kelvin equals N2 times 300 Kelvin. Uh, divide, let's divide through by um, 150 Kelvin. We could have done 300 Kelvin, but let's do 150 Kelvin. So N1 equals N2 times 300 divided by 150 or N2 times 2. Okay, So what that's saying is that the number of moles of N1 is equal to 2 times the number of moles of N2. Right? So the number of moles of gas is twice as large before the reaction as after. So if we look at these options are there anything that, that gives us this ratio? So if we look at choice one, we have one mole of A2 plus one mole of B2 
goes to two moles of AB. So two moles going to two moles. Number of moles isn't changing there. Uh, number two, two moles of AB plus one mole of B2. So that's three moles. That's being converted into two moles of AB2. So that's not the, the correct relationship. Number three, one mole of A plus one mole of B2. So the two moles. That's going to one mole of AB. So that is the correct choice. We have, we're starting out with twice the number of moles of reactant than we're getting as number of moles of the product. Okay. So now briefly I'll just mention um, some rearrangements that can happen with the ideal gas law. And again, this is sort of like what we've already been doing, but um, just a, a little bit more algebra. Right. And one of the ways you can use the ideal gas law is um, by plugging in a density into it or using it to solve for a density. Right. So a density of a gas is proportional to its molar mass, its molecular weight, and it's inversely proportional to its temperature. So how, what do we define density as? Well, density is a mass divided by a volume. How do we define moles, number of moles? That's mass divided by molecular weight. Right, so we can plug this expression in for n, right? Because number of moles, that's just n. So we can plug that into our ideal gas law, mass over molecular weight. And we'll get PV equals m divided by molecular weight times RT. Now we can solve this, or rearrange this equation to give us m divided by v on one side, and that's shown here. And remember, m divided by v, that's just a density. So we can use ideal gas law and, and set it equal to density, and that would be density equals molecular weight times pressure divided by RT. So let's try a practice question like this. Find the density of O2 gas and the number of molecules per liter at, at room conditions, so 20 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. Now remember, uh, on an exam, I'm probably not going to give you, I'm not going to give you this expression probably. I would probably give you this expression, moles equals mass divided by molecular weight. And you would plug this in for N, and then you know you have to rearrange it to solve for a density. So I, I hope that you could, should, could be able to do that. All right, so density equals molecular weight times pressure divided by RT. And so the molecular weight of O2 would be 32 grams per mole. R is just a constant again, 0 0.08205 liters times atmosphere divided by mole Kelvin. Uh, temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, but we add 273 to that. So we get 293 Kelvin. And pressure is one atmosphere. So we plug all those numbers in. Just an easy plug and chug. The density is 1.33 grams per liter, right? Then the second part of the question is asking for the number of molecules per liter. Well, then we just, what we do is we use our grams per liter and convert that into moles per liter. Right? And that's just by dividing by the molecular weight, 32 grams per mole. Right? That'd give us moles per liter, but it's asking for molecules. So then we need to multiply by Avogadro's number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules 
per one mole. Okay. When you do that, you should get something like 2.5 times 10 to the 22nd molecules. Okay. Right, you can also use molar mass in the ideal gas law. Right, so N equals um, mass divided by molecular weight. All right, so we know that expression. Um, if uh, if you're a case where you're not given the molecular weight of something, it's an unknown. Let's say, right? That's when we would. Um, so it, it, up here, w what we've basically done is we've rearranged the Idel gas law to solve for n. So n equals PV divided by RT. Right. But another way you can say N, number of moles, would be mass divided by molecular weight. Right. So this is what we have. If we solve that for molecular weight, what we get is MRT divided by PV. Right. So if we, we're, if we have a mass in, in a temperature, pressure, and volume of an ideal gas, we can back calculate the molecular weight of that ideal gas. And so that's what what problem seven does. I'm going to skip this problem. Um, I, on the top of my head, I don't think you have to do this on the, the homework, but it, it's really just a, a simple plug in and chug if you do. Okay. The final thing we're going to talk about really is mixtures of gases. So gases, remember, they can form solutions and they can mix um, with other gases in any proportion. What, what's interesting about this mixture of gases is that each gas in a mixture behaves as if it were the only gas present. So the pressure exerted by a, a mixture of gases, you can break it down into say what fraction of the total pressure is, is caused by one specific gas. And they, they sort of add together. And this is what's known as partial pressures. Right? And Dalton's law of partial pressure states that the total pressure in a mixture of gases is the sum of the partial pressures of the component gases. So that Dalton, remember Dalton from uh, chapter two, we talked a little bit about him with atomic theory, the same guy. So the partial pressure of a gas is proportional to its mole fraction. So if we want to find the partial pressure of gas A, that's PA, it's going to be equal to equal to its mole fraction times the total pressure of the gas mixture. Okay, so pretty easy, pretty simple, easy equation. You just multiply the total pressure by the mole fraction of the gas you're interested in. And so the mole fraction, just to remind ourselves, is the number of moles of gas A divided by the total number of moles of gas. So if we try a quick problem like this, in a study of O2 uptake by muscle, a physiologist, excuse me, a physiologist prepares an atmosphere consisting of 79 mole percent N2, 20 mole percent O2, 0.9 mole percent argon and 0 0.04 mole percent CO2. Calculate the mole fraction and the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere at sea level. Okay. So we're given a mole percent of CO2. Whoop. Switch back to pen. So that's 0 0.04 mole percent CO2. Well, how do we get from a percentage to a fraction? We have to divide it by 100. Just like if you want, if you want to go from a mole fraction to a mole percentage, you would multiply that by 100. Right, so that gives us 0 0.0004. And that would be our mole fraction of CO2. 
So then calculate the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere at sea level, and that's important, okay? We're not given the pressure. Uh, we're supposed to know that the pressure is at sea level. It's one atmosphere, or 760 torr, right? So that would be our, our total pressure. What would the partial pressure of CO2 be? Well, that's just going to be our mole fraction, 0 0.0004, dang it, times one atmosphere. So that's 0 0.0004 atmospheres. Okay. You could do that with any of the other gases listed above, right? Um, and you could be doing that also in units. It works out really nice because it's one atmosphere, but you could be doing this to something that has a pressure of 300 atmospheres, or um, you could be using different units, 760 torr, let's say. So um, definitely working with one atmosphere is makes things a lot simpler, though. Okay. The ideal gas law uh, can be used to figure out stoichiometry. And so this is probably going to be uh, a little bit uh, important as we go into the final, because this combines Chapter 5 material with also with, with Chapter 3 material. All right. And so the I can't ask an unlimited number of questions on a, an exam, so I, I tend to like to combine material from from multiple chapters, and, and this is one way to do it, right? And as we saw in an example we've already had before, you can use the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas to find the number of moles of that gas, right? Well, you can do that for one gas and then look at a chemical reaction, a chemical equation, and convert from amount of moles of, of one thing to the number of moles of, of another thing, right? Well, you can do that with gases, too. So you can convert from uh, amount of moles of gas A to the amount or moles of gas B. And then, given that n value of B, then you can solve for a pressure, a volume, or a temperature uh, using the ideal gas law. All right, so let's try this final uh, practice question. Iron rusts in air according to the following reaction. So we have 4 iron solid plus 3 O2 gas goes to 2 Fe2O3 solid. Right? So that's the iron oxide solid rust. What volume of air, which is 20% mole ratio oxygen, is needed to rust 55.85 grams of iron to iron oxide at uh, 760 millimeters of mercury, which is just one atmosphere, and 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 degrees Kelvin. Is this a redox reaction? All right, let's, let's pause a second and ask, answer that question. Is this a redox reaction? Well, the answer is yes. Right? So what is um, iron's oxidation number in iron oxide? It's minus two, okay? Uh, what is iron's um, oxidation number in this example? Well, here it'd be a, a plus three. Man, that sucks. Plus three to balance out with the negative charges from oxygen. Okay, what about in the reactants? O2 gas, that's its elemental form, so that'd be zero. Iron, solid iron, that's also going to be a zero oxidation number. So you see that there, there's a change in oxidation numbers. Yes, this is a redox reaction. Okay. Now, uh, answering the first part of the question. The volume um, of air that we need. Right. So what are we given exactly? Well, we want to find a volume of air. We're given uh, 55.8 grams of iron, 
right? So in a, in a sense that that can be our um, n value of one component. We're also given a temperature equals 298 and we're given a total pressure, P total, of one atmosphere. All right, so let's first uh, try to calculate um, the number of moles that we need of, of O2. So 55.85 grams of iron, we divide that by the molecular weight, which just happens to be 55.85 grams per mole. Right, so that gives us one mole of iron, but we need to convert to moles of O2. So we use our ratio from the chemical equation, three moles of O2 for every four moles of iron. So our N value is gonna be 0.75 moles of O2. Okay, can we plug everything in to our PV equals NRT and solve for volume? Not quite yet, right? The reason is because our pressure is atmospheric pressure, but that's from our N2 gas, O2 gas, all, all the different gases combined. So we need to, to calculate the pressure that's only due to oxygen. So pressure of oxygen is gonna be equal to P total times our mole fraction of O2. So one atmosphere is our total pressure and we multiply that, dang it, by 20 mole percent O2. So that mole fraction would be 0.2. And I keep drawing these stupid lines. All right, so that's gonna be equal to 0.2 atmospheres. Okay. Now we can write our PV equals NRT. We want to solve for volume, so rearrange. NRT divided by pressure. And we can plug our, dang it, plug our values in. 0.75 mole times 0 0.08 205 liters atmosphere mole Kelvin times 298 Kelvin I'm sorry about that divided by 0 0.2 atmospheres okay when we do that our volume of O2 gas that we need is going to be 91.7 liters of O2. Okay. So it turns out that all of these behaviors that we've we've seen can be explained by a kinetic theory uh, of gases. So postulate one is that gas particles are tiny very large spaces between them. The volume of each particle is so small compared to the total volume of the gas that it, it basically is assumed to be zero, right? The bigger the molecule, gas molecule gets, the less like the less that this actually applies, but um, for very small diatomic gases, this works very well, this approximation. Gas particles are in constant random straight line motion, except when they collide with each other in the container walls. And the collisions are elastic, and that means colliding particles exchange energy, energy but don't lose any energy due to friction. So basically their total kinetic energy is constant and it's based only on the temperature. Collisions between the particles are not influenced by other attractive or repulsive forces, right? That's not 100% true, but we can just assume that, right? And so really, this is kind of the, the picture um, that explains the kinetic theory. It's really a, a distribution, a probability of, of molecular speeds at a given temperature. So if we look at this, at a lower temperature, you're gonna have a 
a closer range of, of probabilities. Um, as you go up in temperature, that, that probability density spreads out, right? You still have a most probable speed, but the, the, the total speed increases with, with temperature. And so if pressure arises from these collisions of gas particles hitting the, hitting the wall of something, as you increase temperature, the speed, the average speed of the gas molecules is increasing. So that is going to increase the pressure. So as temperature goes up, the speed of the molecule goes up and pressure goes up. Right, and that's exactly what we saw in, in the ideal gas law. Right, so for a given pressure, um, sorry, this is Boyle's law, so we're increasing pressure and temperature and N are fixed. Right, so if we're increasing pressure, um, temperature and N are fixed, um, a higher pressure causes a lower volume, and that results in more collisions uh, because the, the particles are hitting the wall from a shorter average distance. And then the pressure of the gas, in a sense, goes up, and you're equalizing that increased pressure that we, we just put on it. Right? So if you look at Charles's law, at temperature one, we have a certain pressure, and that's equal to atmospheric pressure. We increase temperature, so the collision frequency increases, so the, the gas pressure is increasing, and what that does is it, it's pushing against atmospheric mm -hmm. pressure. It, it, it increases in pressure, so it's above atmospheric pressure, and so it, it pushes up, and what will happen is, from the kinetic theory, the volume is increasing. So then, the eventually, the, the number of molecules, they're not increasing. So the amount of times they're contacting the edge of the container is going to start to slow down as the volume increases. And eventually, you're going to get the pressure, that pressure of the molecules hitting the side of the container, um, going down to equal atmospheric pressure again. Right? It reaches an equilibrium at, a, at that new temperature. Right? And the same can be said for Avogadro's law for just looking at the same vessel again. Now we're pumping more gas molecules into that space, that same volume there. Our collisions are going to go up, so our pressure goes up. Pressure goes up, pushes, pushes the pistons up, up to increase the volume, right? And eventually the collisions are going to decrease again because of the increased volume, and we're going to get a new equilibrium point where the pressure of the gas equals the pressure of the atmosphere. All right, we're going to skip that. Um, don't need to know this kinetic energy equation for, for gases, um, um, so don't worry about that, okay? Basically, it, the molecule's speed really depends on its molecular weight, and it's given by this root mean squared um, value, but we're, we won't be using that in this class. Okay, uh, and this is just an uh, example of molecular speed based on uh, molecular weight, so O2 a fairly large gas has a slower speed than H2, a very light gas, right? Um, so in conclusion, this the last few minutes that I spent talking about this kinetic theory, really don't need to know that for the exam. It, it's really for your information. What you do need to know for the exam is ideal gas law, how to rearrange it, how to use it, um, values it, from one condition to solve for a variable you don't have, and then use that variable, plug it into the ideal gas law to solve for another variable at a second set of conditions. So that's that really is very important um, to be able to rearrange the ideal gas law for that. 
Okay, um, that is the end of this lecture. Uh, well, only one topic remains in the course, and that is uh, Chapter 6, Thermochemistry. And basically, enthalpies are what, would be, what we, we will be talking about in Chapter 6. And I just wanted to remind you again that you can use a 1, 8.5 by 11 front and back page of notes for the final. So don't forget about that. That'll be very, very helpful. You'll, you'll still be given all the equations, constants, and conversion factors you need. So don't put those on your page of notes. Try to put on um, maybe examples of, of how to work certain problems you have trouble with or quantum numbers, the rules for quantum numbers, um, that sort of thing, the stuff that you would normally have to kind of memorize can go on your, your note sheet. All right. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Um, it, and we'll only have a couple more days, so really, if you have any questions from the previous two exams, please let me know in class, and we can go over those. Okay.